Hey, Steve. Hey, Jim. You know, I have been thinking about getting into the Doors lately. Really? Never had you figured for a Doors fan. Well, I heard a record of theirs last night at a party. Yeah? And I've always liked Lever Madly. I guess I should start with their greatest hits. Hey! Greatest hits albums are for housewives and little girls. You're not serious. You don't want to be a Doors fan. Get out of my store. All right. Uh, as always, we're starting off with something fun. That is the kids in the hall from one of their famous skits from the early 80s. Truly, truly a Doors fan. <laughs> but this leads into our topic for today, Steve. Greatest Hits albums. That's right. Boy, I like Greatest Hits. So now so I know where I rank. <laughs> is there a shame? We'll yeah. find out. <laughs> But first, as always, let's cover some of this week's pickups. You got some goodies? Yeah, there was. Uh, you know, I actually, is another, you know, last week we talked about Jim showing albums after I buy it someplace else because I can't <laughs> find it. Well, sure as heck, I bought the box tops, the letter. Are and you kidding me? I'm kidding you not. <laughs> I had to go all the way down to North Carolina to find that thing. And what happens the next week? Jim shows, bring, brings it out. Oh, two of them. There's two of them out there. Unbelievable. So I bought that. <laughs> Uh, Nico Case just came out with a uh, brand new album, Wild Creatures, which is an assortment of past tracks. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be a subject here we could talk about in about five minutes or so. Sure. <laughs> uh, there was another, and you'll like this one. The name of the group is called Sumos, and the album's called Surfacing, and they're from Manchester, England. And I learned about them on the website Django Pop Hub. <laughs> Django that, Pop Hub. hub yeah, that, that, this, this would be episode 19, everyone. Django Pop Hub. It's called, and they called it Sunny Django Pop with a surf rock vibe uh, okay. to it. So, Hey, I'm on board. Okay, yes. It's very upbeat music. It's really, really good. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I think it's pronounced Sumos, S-U-M-O-S. I don't know. But it's just one of these off the wall kind of things. Jangle pop. There we go. How about you, Jim? Well, before we get to mine, I want to give you just a little solace on the box tops. The copies that we got in are just beat. They're they're beat up. They're super cheap. It's a rare record, I know, that will fetch normally in the twenty to thirty dollar range. It's about right. Yeah, mine mine's isn't very good okay. either. So I'll well, take a look yeah. at those and see. Uh, but I did a couple of interesting ones here. First off. Um, I grabbed a couple of Kinks records. I'm a, I'm a Kinks fan. I like the 80s Kinks, although everybody, you know, the early Kinks is great, but they had this kind of metamorphosis through the 70s where they got very prog-like in some cases, and they did a lot of concept albums. I'm a fan of the 80s Kinks as well, but okay. uh, I, a couple I didn't have. I got Misfits from 1978, which is a fun one, and one that I'm not familiar with, and this is one of their concept albums from 1975, Soap Opera. Oh, so I added them I didn't in. Know that. Yeah, it, it came after Preservation Society one and two. Okay. So it's kind of a continuation of that a whole idea of we're going to do a concept album about something. Um, and so this is there. I've not given a lot of uh, time to it yet. I gave it a spin and listened to it. But because I like the Kinks and I like to have a lot of their stuff, I'm going to add them in and see where they go from there. But the biggie, and this is from uh, we we've talked before about how I sometimes have the. Uh, what do you want to call it? A fault of when stuff comes into the store, especially larger collections. Mm -hmm. I try to give it a quick perusal first to make sure that there's not something huge. And then it gets boxed up and put in our storeroom until I can get to them box by box by box. Yeah. Well, one of those ones that I saw that this was in there and never gave it much of a thought. It's a good record. It's going to be a valuable record, but I didn't dig into it because I didn't have a time. Well, I, I got to it and it's a Beastie Boys licensed to ill. Now, in and of itself, it it's, can be a $100 record if it's in good condition for pressings. This one, however, turns out to be a misprint that did not exist on Discogs until I got that uploaded in there. Okay. And the misprint being that um, the label, the B-side label, is blank except for the Def Jam and Columbia logos. So there's no song titles listed on there. Mm -hmm. And also the, the runouts were different than everything else on Discogs. So I was able to put in a unique Discogs entry that, uh, well, let me look here real quick. So far as putting it in there, I'm the only one that has it. Okay. <laughs> in the Discogs universe. Yeah. 
So the valuation on something like that is going to be tremendously difficult because good first pressings, again, can fetch in the $120 to $130 range. But if this is truly a one-of-a-kind misprint, what's that going to lead to? Yeah. But I'm going to hold on to it regardless because I like I like that album, and it's uh, it's a good one to have. Yeah, it so is. That's a fun one. We'll see what happens down the line if I ever decide to move it, but I don't think I'm going to. Yeah. Neat. Wow. Okay. But it's not a greatest hits album. No. <laughs> We, we talked about this topic a while back, and uh, there was a couple of different ways to approach this. Because when you talk about greatest hits, you're usually talking about something that is kind of an introductory for a music fan. Mm-hmm. Joking around about the doors like the kids in the hall did at the, at the top of our show. You know, that's a good way to think about this. Now, in Wikipedia, again, it's online. Anybody can say what they want in Wikipedia. But they call greatest hits albums or best of albums are a type of compilation album that that collects popular and commercially successful songs by a particular artist or band. While greatest hits albums are typically supported by the artist, they can also be created by record companies without express approval from the original artist as a means to generate more sales. Mm -hmm. And they're typically regarded as a good starting point for new fans of an artist, but are sometimes criticized by longtime fans as not inclusive enough or even necessary at all in the first place. When I started record collecting, you know, I was buying 45s, but not albums. So I joined Columbia Record Club for one penny, and we got the 13 albums. And that was, I believe, 75 or 76. Of those 13 albums, I bought Elton John's Greatest Hits, Santana's Greatest Hits, Seals and Crofts' Greatest Hits, Steppenwolf's Greatest Hits, <laughs> Sly and the Family Stone. I bought, uh, t- uh, let's see, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Bowie's, you know, Changes, and War, all greatest hits. For a penny. For a penny. Because this was my, you know, I didn't know anything about what the other albums would be like, but these had their greatest hits. And it opened the door for me. And ever since then, I've always been a fan of greatest hits. Now, there are some Reddit threads out there that... uh, where people ask this question, is there shame? I mean, literally, the title of the thread was, is it shameful? I mean, is, is, am I opening myself up to ridicule by enjoying Greatest Hits albums? Even on YouTube, that, that happens. Within the vinyl community, they, they start talking about, oh, Greatest Hits, you shouldn't have them. They're no good. And I find absolutely no shame. I like to sing along to a song. It's, <laughs> it's, when I'm driving, especially... I don't want some obscure track that's going to just kind of make me lose interest. I want to be joining in. Give me a good chorus. Throw a hook at me there and give me a song I know. And I'm just fun to watch as I drive, especially if you're near a driver. They go, what's up with that guy? Well, the the whole notion of it being an introductory, as you mentioned with your Columbia House stuff, is, is probably the best argument for a Greatest Hits album. You know, if you're a younger kid, you may be working a part-time job, you don't have a lot of disposable income to be a completist and say, I'm going to go out and buy every single Fleetwood Mac album there is. Fleetwood Mac's Greatest Hits has got you covered, and it's more economical. Uh, But we had this actually just this week in the store. I had a customer in. They were holding a copy of Rumors in one hand and Fleetwood Mac's Greatest Hits in the other hand, and they were comparing the track lists. Now, Rumors in and of itself, is almost a Greatest Hits album because it's such a fantastic album. But ultimately, they decided on the Greatest Hits because it had a couple from Fleetwood Mac and a couple of other ones on there as well. But that, I think, is probably the best way to look at this. I can get more bang for the buck with this one record. How And how I, I look at it now is my collection I'm trying to limit. I have a smaller amount of space that I am using. I can't afford to get a... a every album from an artist. A greatest hits often takes care of it. For instance, you look at the group like the Stylistics from the 70s. Mm-hmm. Each album had a hit on there, possibly two hits, but that was really it. And so a great, you know, instead of buying six albums, within one I have all of their greatest hits. Or you look back to the 60s where someone or a group would come up with that hit and then you had to get all this filler to go onto that album. They'd make their next album. They'd make that one specific for a 45, you know, that hit. I'm going to put this 45 out. Now let's make an album around it. In comes the filler. A greatest hits on something like that 
gets rid of all that filler. And that's a that's a very good point as well, because some of these artists, let's be honest, really haven't got the fuel in the tank to go past one or two legitimate hits. Yes. <laughs> and it, to this day, that happens. You know, we've we, we, we've had fun making fun of aha uh-huh here. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 we, we don't necessarily, you know, we've never met them. We have nothing personally against them, but it just kind of cracks up where when there was like a huge gigantic package of, you know, coming out for the, the one aha uh-huh album that had the one hit. Now, to, to be fair, though, with groups like that, a greatest hits can come out because in Europe, they probably, they had a ton of hits. It's just in the American market, there's maybe one, maybe two. They have the Living Daylights they made for James Bond movie. Yeah. That was one. But maybe most of their other ones were huge in Europe. So a greatest hits package by them opens us up to a bunch of music from a group that was super popular in Europe, but we didn't know much about. So it could be, you know, possibly for AHA to do that to say, aha, see, we have more you know, than, than what you thought we had. And maybe then we'll go back and buy some of their other albums. Well, this could also bring up a, a an important distinction between a greatest hits album and a best of. I mean, all too often you say, oh, well, they're the same thing. Well, that's not necessarily the case. The greatest hits, you could argue, are certifiable hits, billboard charting hits. Yeah. And you get a band like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones that has proven i mean a proven track record of creating hits throughout their career those are no-brainers in fact some of the biggest and best albums from the stones and the beatles tend to be greatest hits remember the red and the blue Mm -hmm. the uh, two beatles albums um and uh, the stones the octagon shape uh those i think are are certifiable as really good albums in and of their own right because the band had so many hits you take something like aha uh someone like aha and say okay well not technically a greatest hits, but let's call it a best of. And that way the band can have input and say, here's some of the other stuff from some of our other albums, as you mentioned, that we would like um, our, the fans exposed to. Oftentimes when I think of things like that, you know, Grateful Dead would be a good group for best of. They they have some hits out there. They don't always transfer the best over to a greatest hits no. because what's Grateful Dead known for long jams? But a best of allows them to kind of go in because they, they know what their fans really like and to pull something like that, and they can probably make a better album. Another example of this, and I'm going to pick on my beloved Rush for the same thing. Most of that was AOR, album-oriented rock, mm-hmm. and in some cases, concept albums which then does not translate very well into chopping up into pieces. Pink Floyd, the same thing. That's a classic example. Absolutely. Pink Floyd was first thing that I came, came to my mind is greatest hits. It's choppy because the songs run one into another. So, was, you know, you have money going on. So it stops, you know, it, it, it takes away. And, and that's where a lot of people, obviously, they argue about the problem of greatest hits is this song was part of a whole thing. To your point, Rush, it's a concept or whatever. And so it's the flow. And a greatest hits takes away from that. Personally, I just want to sing along and I don't care about their concept. There are... <laughs> see you in your car pulling along. Money! Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Now, with Pink Floyd, and you mentioned that so many of their songs run together, you know, On Wish You Were Here, The Wall, same thing as Dark Side. Yeah. Uh, There are a couple of different Pink Floyd greatest hits or best of compilations out there, one being that collection of great dance songs. Mm -hmm. But not only does that kind of do a disservice to the album as a whole, but in some cases, and I, I would imagine that these were put together by the label, it kind of messes with the continuity of a discography meaning that you have to know that the wall came after Dark Side of the Moon, and yet they're putting a comfortably numb before, you know, breathe or something like that. So it almost, for fans, for truer fans, it feels a bit disjointed knowing that a group has had a storied history and that history is kind of rearranged to fit better onto a record. 
or for whatever reason the labels decided. And, 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 you know, their music had a definite trend and it changed through time. So when they do that, they take it so it's suddenly you had this really early stuff and then something brand new and they are so opposite and so different instead of having that nice transition yep. to kind of really feel their music. Now, there is one Pink Floyd compilation out there and it escapes me right now what it is, uh, the title of it. I'd have to look it up. But I think that the band may have had a hand in this where they actually took that kind of chopped up version of a lot of stuff from their various albums, but took the time to mix them together. So it had that flow of a true Pink Floyd album. I think that that exists out there. I could be I could be imagining it, but I think that I had run across that once before. Okay, yeah, there are, you know, some, you know. Again, you know, we talked Pink Floyd's kind of hard, Grateful Dead's kind of hard. You know, you think jazz. Jazz oh, yeah. is, is another. It's You don't see a lot of greatest hits in jazz. Miles Davis has a greatest hits, but for the most part, you know, I'm sure uh, Coltrane does, but you don't see a lot of that. It's because it's about this whole, this type of music that they want in a kind of flows. Uh, classical, you do find greatest hits, but again, it's just taking little snippets of a composition some of the more recognizable for lack of a better term riffs yes will. yes that everyone it's very very common but you know it kind of blows apart what they're trying to do but to, if you're not a big classical fan hey i only want that i only want those little riff parts that Odd, makes me happy oddly enough i, I cataloged something the other day it was called classical 101 it's a double lp yeah. compilation of the stuff that everybody knows. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of great classical music out there if you dig into the composers, but you're going to have your Beethoven, da 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 yeah. that and uh, the Bach. But it, I found that a very interesting, and there's lots of those. KTEL put out a bunch as well yes, of classical music compilations of that nature. And I think that does a disservice, much like Floyd and Rush, it does a disservice to the music. Yes, but uh, you know, if, in, if you are into classical, definitely you don't like it. And this is a case where I could be more snobbish. But I still do like some of those little classical cuts at times. But yeah, it, it, it is kind of a different beast to look at. Again, it's about in- introducing. You know, I think Big Star. You know, when I, I I bought a Big Star Greatest Hits CD, that's that was my introduction to Big Star. I really didn't know anything about. I knew about the group. I knew about the name. I did not know the music. But by getting this, and again, Big Star's Greatest Hits. Think about that. What hits? You know, yeah. <laughs> kind of like Velvet Underground Greatest Hits. What hits? Uh, but yeah, uh, that might be more of the best stuff. But it did introduce me, and it, I wound up getting. All, all the big star stuff, their, their first three albums, because of that greatest hits package. Uh, so, yeah, makes a difference. It's also kind of an interesting way to think of, I'm going to use it as kind of a filling a hole in my collection until type of thing. For the longest time, I had a cult greatest hits until they reissued Love, which I, I truly love that album. It's a great album, and I actually replaced the cult's greatest hits when I got the Love uh, same thing, I've got a Pixies, you know, and if I ever decide I want to keep a correct Pixies album, I'll let that greatest hits go. But it's a way to enjoy the music until you can find just the right fit for your collection. Sure. And, and then you have groups like ACDC that refuses to put out a greatest yep. hits. They, you, you want the hits, you buy all our albums is their whole philosophy. That's the way it is. <laughs> now, you can get them on live albums. But yep. it's not quite the same. No, no, it's not the same. But it's again, that's a live performance, and if they're really good, then they they mask that. But it's a live album, like a Leonard Skinner live. Those are very famous. The Peter Frampton, you know, his yes, very very famous live album. And but again, we're talking something where his regular albums are only a buck or two in the used uh-huh. market anyway. It, it and then there's you know you mentioned the Rolling Stones. How many greatest hit packages are there of the Rolling Stones? I. It, it goes on forever. They keep redoing them. Now, they have hits, but they have rehashed them. It's like, well, let's not do it. And, and I believe they own all, all their own music, so they're going to get the money from all this. Instead of an album, do a greatest hits this year. And you see a lot of groups will do that. It's an easy way to cash in. You don't have to really come up with something. Give them the greatest hits, and they're going to buy it. You can also look at something, uh, let's say, like a Buffalo Springfield or more appropriately, the Yardbirds. 
yeah. as as a group, the Yardbirds I think really only had I'm trying to remember two or three albums tops that uh, more more accessible than are the number of greatest hits. You mentioned that the Stones have a lot. The Yardbirds, there was just another variation of a Yardbirds greatest hits that came out a couple of months ago. It's all the same music, just rearranged a little bit differently and pressed on virgin vinyl. Does that for you? kind of goes more toward the best of, you know, yep. Buffalo Springfield, you know, excellent example. You know, two songs when you get their best of or whatever that you could think of that were really out there that hit the charts. And after that, maybe the other ones didn't. I just have never heard them, but. Still yeah. a great way to go. Um, I did some history digging on this as well. Uh-huh. And according, again, to Wikipedia, take that uh, however you wish, they say the first Greatest Hits album, take a guess, the very first Greatest Hits album released in 1958, I may take exception to that, but according to this, was Johnny Mathis' Greatest Hits. Wow. But uh, the album collected eight of Mathis' charting singles and added three non-charting B-sides from the 45s as an altogether new track. Um, The album then spent three weeks at the number one spot on Billboard's best-selling pop LP charts. And, you know, you kind of just brought up something I was thinking about. You know, again, I could go back to use the Rolling Stones. I could use Jethro Tall. They keep putting out new greatest hits, but then they go, we have one track that's never (laughs) been released before. Here it is. It's on here. So as you're, you're sitting there, you know, you already have, you know, six greatest hits from them, you know, packages. Well, if I don't buy this seventh one, I'm not going to have that one track that's on there. And how often does that one happen? You know, (laughs) throw it on. But again, that comes down to marketing and making sure that they're getting the most bang out of the buck, especially for artists that still own a lot of their their libraries. Yeah. Uh, you know, a group, the Cramps, the third Cramps album was Bad Music for Bad People. Yeah. This took the best tracks from their first two albums only. I mean, they'd only put out two albums, Songs of the Lord Taught Us and Psychedelic Jungle in 1881. So in 84, they come up with Bad Music for Bad People. I guess that's a compilation, but that might be, but it is like a best of, here's the best of these two albums, but it was just kind of funny. I mean, it's a, it's an incredibly good album. It puts it all together, but they'd only put out a couple albums. That was my foray into the cramps as well, was Bad Music for Bad People. And I guess I didn't realize at the time, though, that that was kind of a compilation that I didn't know anything about them. Yeah. Another great example is R.E.M.'s Eponymous. Mm-hmm. And that is probably one of their biggest sellers but because it, it pulled together. We talked about this in the Jangle Pop episode where folks were still getting used to this brand new sound that R.E.M. was putting out there. So I think putting all of those uh, songs into a compilation, then that was, what, probably six years into their, their existence? Yeah was probably a, a very good move on their part because it consolidated that and opened them up to a lot of new people. Yes. And, and then there's, you know, groups like, I don't think Uskadoo's ever done anything with the greatest. I cannot think of any compilations with them. Not necessarily with them, but take uh, a few years back, the Bob Mould box, box sets. Yeah. That gathered together not only his work solo-wise, but his work with Uskadoo and his work with Sugar. Yeah. So, I mean, is that a greatest hits when a solo artist breaks out and creates these mammoth box set series <laughs> that you have to have? Yeah, which I have all four of them. I don't know. That's that's that that is a hell of a greatest hits package. It is, but it takes up a lot of space, it which does. negates the point. Yeah, yeah. That's where that single space. album sure is a lot better. But you know, it would be nice to see just a single album of. Uskadoo's greatest hits. I, I think replacements have done it, but I don't think they, they ever have. But a lot of groups haven't. But that would have to be a best of because how many hits did they yeah. really oh, have? Yeah. So some of the biggest greatest hits or best ofs that are out there. Um, you know, I've got, uh, I can I can point to the Fleetwood Mac as being a big seller in the store as well. The Rolling Stones, mm-hmm. always a good seller. Uh, the Eagles, that uh, mm-hmm. their greatest hits, the bluer one with the skull yep. on there has actually, it holds the distinction of being one of the top-selling albums of all time. Not necessarily the greatest hits, but actual album sales of all time. I guess that was Columbia House, too. That was another one. So now I'm up (laughs) nine of the 13 were greatest hits. I forgot about that one. But that's another great example of, okay, the Eagles had this big, big storied history. And 
yes, Hotel California is a great album and uh, long run and all of, they got some great songs, but there's usually one or two standouts on the album. And when I put together, how can you not look at that and say, man, this is such a great collection of all of this great music. Yeah. And it's kind of nice to you know, you have people over, put that on the turntable. It's, it's music everyone knows, everyone understands and can enjoy and listen to instead of some of these more obscure tracks where people kind of lose interest in it. Interesting point on that as well. Now, greatest hits are not a thing of the past. They're still doing these things. We've talked about that with kind of the uh, the various artists um, and the tributes, which not greatest hits in this case, but close to. I'm looking at uh, our, our distributor catalog of upcoming releases here. And uh, coming up very, very, uh, actually in the next week or so here, this, this is going to boggle your mind. There's two that are standouts um, that uh, I want to uh, mention here. One is Farewell, the very best of Foreigner. Okay, so Foreigner is one of those groups. It's a 70s, 80s group that had a lot of legitimate hits yep. on their side. So, But this is called the very best of. It's 11 of Foreigner's greatest hits released as individually numbered limited edition 5,000 copies on gold vinyl. So right off the bat, they're kicking it up there. So feels like the first time. Cold, of, cold as Ice. Hot-Blooded, Double Vision, Head Games, Dirty White Boy, Urgent, Waiting for a Girl Like You, Jukebox Hero, and I Want to Know What Love Is. Certifiable. Every one of those is a great song, great hit. Now, do you own any Foreigner albums? I do. Okay. Would you pay $50 for a single LP of Foreigner Greatest Hits? Nope. That's the list price on this one. But again, it's on gold-colored vinyl, and it's limited to 5,000. Is that going to be enough of a selling point for a collection of records? And there's another one, the Greatest Hits Foreigner's Records, in and of itself is all of these same songs on vintage vinyl. It is. That is for a true collector of Foreigner or someone that collects for more value. Uh, you're wanting it. So, uh, But you know, for an average collector, you go, why would, why would you get that? Same thing with this other one um, coming up as a very soon release is Survivor. Now, I don't think a lot about Survivor outside of Eye of the Tiger, and I could laugh them off as being a one-hit wonder, but they are not, and I, I'd take some heat from Survivor fans. No, they're not. They had, well, yes, they did have some legitimate hits. Um, things like, uh, well, Eye of the Tiger, Can't Hold Back, High on You, The Search Is Over, Burning Heart, Is This Love, and a couple more. But the best of Survivor coming out on blue vinyl and black vinyl, kind of a mix, double LP for $60. Oh, actually, that's not a double LP. That's a single LP. Holy cow. $60 list price for the best of Survivor. <laughs> you could buy their complete catalog for a less price than that. I mean, they're, well, they're, yeah, I see you used to be able to find them in Goodwill, but after last week, we learned you can't. But still, that's, that's nuts. And I apologize to our listeners because I'm going to have to do a visual thing with Steve here as I move this around. But that's the Foreigner album cover, which Ooh. it looks neat. It's cool. The gold vinyl looks neat. But then Survivor is just them on the cover looking like it's 1988. That's right. It's like 60 on. Wow. That has to be some real diehard Survivor fans because, I again, that's... None of their albums, unless I've missed the market and they've gone nuts. Did one of them die or what? I have no idea wow. on that. So I think that there's a limit to greatest hits, and I would like to think that the labels would recognize this. Something like that, Survivor, is obviously, I mean, it's obviously a cash grab on that. Mm-hmm. I can't see that that album costs that much to license and or press to warrant a $60 price tag. But again, if someone's willing to pay for yep. it. That's what it's all about. If you're willing to pay for it and and everyone does, then someone else goes, well, they did that. Let's do it 65 on ours. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have a favorite Greatest Hits album? Um, Boy, that one's really, oh, gosh darn it. Well, the bad music for bad people, for the cramps. Well, yeah, yeah, the, you that. know, Velvet Underground. Again, it's more of a best of from Velvet Underground. And actual greatest hits. You know, Elton John's first greatest hits, I, I think, is an incredibly good album. I mean, it is just total killer on there. Same thing with his uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. I mean, that's uh, it was a really neat package as well. And I'll say that was kind of a cool one, too. Billy Joel had a greatest hits album. 
um, double LP of his stuff. And that came out in the late 80s as well. Goes That's, for a lot of it money. It goes for a lot of money. I was going to say that. Yeah, it does. On the, the resale market on that is in the 30 to $40 range, for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah. I, I always thought that is a bargain bin thing. It's like when I was looking to get Billy Joel, because I did not want to buy all his albums, so I was going for that greatest hits, and I looked at that price and go, what? <laughs> you know, on Discogs, of course, then it's even higher. Got to pay that extra $23, 23% fee, and it's like, what the heck? Yeah, same thing, Journey's Greatest Hits, real good one to have. You know, I'm thinking of something like a Hendrix, which is always a popular greatest hit. Sly and the Family Stones. Yep. I mean, yep. that is that is their best-selling album, uh, their greatest hits, mm-hmm. and because it, it just put it all together. So in your opinion, then, no shame whatsoever for a greatest hits album. Absolutely no shame. At maybe if people see me singing in the car to it, but that would be about it. <laughs> That's but, a different kind of shame. Yeah, it's a different kind of shame. <laughs> now, I, I have always loved greatest hits since I've started, and to this day, I will still seek them out. I just And as you collect and you're trying to limit your collection, I can't think of a better way to go. And I will absolutely agree with you. And I do see the point where some people are going to be purists, and say, no, you should have every single Doors album that are out there. I mean, take me for example. I think I've got pretty much every single Doors album, but I also have the greatest hits. And the greatest hits is what sits on my shelf. Uh, while the other albums, the more collectible ones, I keep them at uh, in, a, in a separate spot. Where the greatest hits is more accessible, I can pull it out and throw it on and play it. But if I ever want that deep dive, because I'm a Doors fan, I'm not really a Doors yeah. fan that big, but you, you've got that opportunity to deep dive if you have the means and the wherewithal for everything. And I would only need the Doors Greatest Hits, and I would be perfectly happy. <laughs> well, then you're a Doors fan, Yeah, man. yeah that's right. <laughs> well, you have been listening to two guys talking about records, a vinyl community podcast. As always, that's what we do here, isn't it? <laughs> that's all we do. And we do absolutely nothing else. I mean, we, we don't even have jobs anymore. This is oh, just what we do. If only. <laughs> but we're doing okay. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, as always, you guys, if you... If you're listening to us on YouTube, check us out on Spotify and iHeartRadio. If you're listening to us on iHeartRadio or Spotify, check it out on YouTube. And make sure you check out Steve's channel on YouTube. Especially check out that channel so you can see Cat every week. That's the very least. Yes. What's, what's your channel? Uh, Steve Carlson, Vinyl Community. Pretty easy. Easy to find. And every Sunday you put up your finds and... Midweek, you do some fun stuff and record store tours and all of that good stuff. Yep, we try to keep it interesting and going, but that the Sunday one's the big one where we show the new music. Cool. And as always, you can check our stuff out at uh, the Radio Wasteland Records YouTube channel or RadioWastelandRecords.com. But there's our plugs. There, yeah, yes. <laughs> Shameless plugs. Throw a Greatest Hits album on now. All right. Okay. We'll yes. get the day going. <laughs> all right, Steve. Thanks, and thank you all for listening. You guys have a great week. Yep. Everyone have a great week. Thanks, Jim. 